Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. I'm Joseph and in the last video we spoke about an overview of the population balance modeling approach. So in this particular video here we are going to go a little bit further and take a look specifically at what the number density function which is central to the use of population balance modeling is. We are going to look at what it means and how to interpret the number density function. So remember in the last video we showed this general population balance equation. So just to remind everyone and give a recap of, of what we have uh, discussed in the last video, the first term in this general PBE or population balance equation here tells us how the number density evolves with time. So the number density here is represented by this small n here and it's a scalar component. So this number density and how it evolves with time is given by this partial derivative of the number density with respect to time. The second term in this general population balance equation here tells us how the number density evolves with the internal coordinate space. Remember, we gave an example whereby if your particle is capable of growing in size over time, then there's going to be a velocity of the particle in the internal coordinate space or in the space of this particle size. So in this case, then the, this second term here would tell us how the number density evolves with the internal coordinate space. The third term in the general population balance equation here tells us how the number density evolves with the physical space. R here is the physical space. And the last term here, which is, which is h here, is the source or the sink term that will account for any possible aggregation or breakage of the particles involved, right? Any interaction between the particles, whether they break or they combine together to form one large particle, this will be accounted for by the source and the sink term. So just a quick note here, the number density is a scalar component, okay? So it's not written in both phase. Right, it's a scalar component. And the x here, which is the property of the particle, here we will give it a more fanciful term called the internal coordinate. So this internal coordinate will be a vectorial component. So this internal coordinate here can be anything that you pick, whether it's size, whether it's volume of particle, whether it's the mass of the particle, whether it's the edge of a cell, anything that you pick. So this in general is a vectorial component and this R here is your physical space or we call it the external coordinate. So this physical space here can go up to three dimensions. So it is also a vectorial component. The source and the sink term here is going to be a scalar component. So let's go ahead with this in mind and let's just take a look at what defines the number density function. Before we talk about the number density function, we need to understand what the particle state is. So consider a tank here where you are actually dispersing some solids into the tank and you actually have water in the tank. So you are actually dispersing some solids into water. So the dispersed phase here would be the solid phase. And the waters that surrounds the solid will be what we call the continuous phase. So how do we characterize the number density function given such a system? Firstly, the number density function is a function of the internal coordinate. So what are the internal coordinate? Internal coordinate, as mentioned just now, represents the property of the particle that you are actually interested in. For example, it could be the volume of particle. It could be the mass of particle. It could also be the degree of polymerization if you are studying polymer system or it could represent the edge of the cell in your system. Anything that describes your particle property, this is given by the internal coordinate. And sometimes the internal coordinate may not just be one dimension. If you have a particle and you can correct, characterize it by the length and the width, for example, then you have a multi-dimensional system in a sense that you have two internal coordinates, the length and the width. So in general, this internal coordinate x here is a vector quantity as you could have more than one dimension in your internal coordinate vector. So this internal coordinate will form part of the particle state because this is one of the information that you need to understand your particle. But that is not all. On top of the internal coordinate 
which you need to characterize your particle, you also need to know where the particle is at in the physical space. So this is where the external coordinate come in. Imagine again, you have this similar tank example here. When you actually measure the number density or the distribution of the particle at different, different location, you are most likely going to result in different number density or different distribution that you can measure. So generally, we can also say that the number density function is a function of the external coordinate or the physical space, spatial coordinates, R. And R here is a vector component. Both X and R here consists of what we call the particle state because they give the full information of what you are after for your particle. You characterize your particle by what kind of internal coordinate you use to characterize them and where they are, their location in the physical space. There is also something that we have not spoke about thus far, which is the continuous phase. Refer back to the same example again. The particle or the solid is what we call the dispersed phase, but the water or the environment is what we call the continuous phase. So the continuous phase might also come into the picture when modeling physical systems like this. This continuous phase here usually is governed by the laws of transport, for example, the species advection diffusion equation, if you actually have mass transfer. For example, if your solids is capable of uh, releasing some uh, solute into the environment or into the continuous phase and there is going to be some diffusion or some mass transfer then those part those phenomena that happens at the continuous phase must be accounted for by the other laws of transport that we are familiar in transport phenomena however in this video series here we are not going to be too concerned about what happens in the continuous phase because we are going to make an assumption and say that the dispersed phase fraction is minimal in the cases that we study and so it does not cause any change in the continuous phase for example if the particles does not dissolve and cause a viscosity change in the continuous phase then we do not need to be too concerned about this phenomena happening at the continuous phase and we can only look at the dispersed phase so this is going to be the major assumption that we will um, go by when we talk about population balance modeling in this video series. So to summarize here, the number density function as what we have defined is a function of the internal coordinate vector x and it is also a function of the external coordinate r. So the unit of the number density function would be number of particles per unit volume of the physical space per unit of the internal coordinate space. So given, if you are given the number density function, right, if you know what is the number density function, and if you are interested in the total number of particles in the entire system throughout the internal and external coordinate space, then one would just simply integrate over the domain of the external and internal coordinate, integrate over the entire domain, and then you will get the total number of particles in the entire system. Using the tank example that we have just now, so this would be similar to saying that we are interested in the total number of particles throughout the entire system. Now, throughout the external coordinate space and the internal coordinate space. But what if, if you are only interested in a fixed point in space, right? The total number of particles per unit physical volume in space the external coordinate is just given by the integral over the internal coordinate space. So this is if you are interested in, let's say in the tank, you are interested at a particular particular point. In general, the local number density would be different at every different point in space. But if you can remove the dependence on the space, the spatial dependence, then you can simplify further the number density. You can say that for a well-made system, the total number of particle per unit volume is equals to integration of the number density function over the internal coordinate space. You can make such simplification if you want to. So how should we interpret the number density function? So this number density function that we spoke about here, which is a function of the internal coordinate and the external coordinate, and also a function of time, should be seen as just an average number density function. Imagine we revisit the tank example again, where we throw in 
a bunch of particles into the tank and we assume that the number of particles in the tank is abund sufficiently abundant so that continuum doesn't break down right because in reality particles are discrete in nature but when the number is able to fill both the internal and the external coordinate space sufficiently in a sufficiently abundant manner then we can say that we can uphold continuum and then we can prescribe the number density function as a smooth function of the internal and external coordinate and time but this should be viewed only in the average sense because if we look at the example if we are able to make measurements of the distribution at various various location in the tank every time we make the measurement it's not going to give us the same number density or the same distribution however as we make more and more measurement as we approach an infinite number of measurement we would expect that the number density that we measure will converge to an average behavior so this is what we call an expected value of the true number density therefore the number density function that we use or adopt in the population balance equation shown here should be interpreted as the average number density function so this should be treated as an expected value of the true number density function because the true number density function we do not know what it is but if we are able to make many many measurements we expect that there will be an expected value of it the, the the measurements would converge to an average value in that sense so that is all about number density function for this video if you find this video helpful please feel free to leave a like and subscribe and feel free to also comment down below on what other videos you would like me to make on population balance modeling see you soon